Welcome. This is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. This is going to be the last in our series of CROI 2020 reviews. Today I'm going to focus on some updates on two drug or dual ART and an update on HIV cure. I don't have any conflicts or relationships to disclose. These are the studies or abstracts I'm going to review today. First, an update on dolutegravir lamivudine, initial ART, 96-week virologic data was just published last month, and then there was an update on virologic failures and resistance from CROI, and then an update on the two-drug therapy of islatrovir and duraverine, focusing on metabolic outcomes, and then an update on the London patient, and a couple other mentions about HIV cure. So with that, let's talk about dolutegravir lamivudine. As a review, the Department of Health and Human Services guidelines were updated in December. Here are the listed options that are quote unquote recommended for most people with HIV. A major update was the addition of this dolutegravir 3TC or dolutegravir lamivudine dual initial ART option with the important caveats that we should only recommend it if somebody has a viral load below 500,000, no hepatitis B infection, and then this note that baseline genotype results should be available. To me, that's the most controversial part of these criteria, but I do think that's limiting, especially in this era where we are often, if not nearly always, recommending very early ART prior to genotype results being available. So let's talk about dolutegravir lamivudine, the data as initial ART. This was the Gemini study, which we have reviewed before, but I'm going to review and then give some updates. So this is dolutegravir lamivudine as initial ART compared to dolutegravir plus TDF-FTC, one very Obvious limitation of this is it's not a comparison to TAF, which is a part of most of our initial therapy options, but I do think this data is important to review. So this was a randomized controlled trial that enrolled treatment-naive adults. Importantly, viral loads had to be under 500,000. There had to be no existing resistance mutations, no chronic hepatitis B, no need for hep C therapy, and not pregnant or breastfeeding. You can see here the one-to-one -one randomization to either two-drug initial ART with dolutegravir lamivudine or more standard triple ART with dolutegravir plus FTC TDF. These are the baseline characteristics, uh, which I've reviewed before and won't go into in a lot of detail, but I will just highlight that around 20% of the participants had a viral load above 100,000, again, still below 500, so in between 100,000 and 500,000, so it was about a fifth of the participants. Here are the 48 week virologic response data, which we had already seen. But the key point here is that looking at viral load below 50 copies at 48 weeks, the response to dolutegravir lamivudine for treatment-naive individuals was non-inferior to three-drug therapy with dolutegravir plus FTC TDF that did not change by baseline viral load. Here are the same results by baseline CD4 count. An interesting note here that the virologic response with dolutegravir lamivudine two-drug initial therapy did fall off with CD4 below 200, though that did not make it into the criteria in the guidelines for recommending this as first-line therapy, which I find interesting. I don't know the rationale behind that, but I would pause to recommend this for somebody with a very low CD4 count. And then here is the update from last month. This is the 96-week virologic response that was published. And the key point here is that still dolutegravir lamivudine was shown to be non-inferior in terms of virologic response at 96 weeks as compared to the three-drug option. And you can see here that again, regardless of baseline viral load, the results were non-inferior. So then here's the update from CROI. The investigators looked more at confirmed virologic withdrawal. So these are participants who had a virologic rebound and met criteria for virologic failure and stopped therapy because of viral load rebound. You can see here there were 11 instances of confirmed virologic failure in the two-drug arm and seven in the three-drug arm. That was not statistically different. And then the real goal here was to try to answer the question of what is the risk of virologic failure and what is the risk of emergent new resistance during two-drug therapy with dolutegravir lamivudine. Uh, you can see here that there was no real difference in the rates of virologic withdrawal by baseline viral load or CD4 count. 
Many of those who failed did so with relatively low viral loads. Most of those individuals who met criteria for failure appeared to be not adhering regularly to their treatment. This was assessed by looking at their viral load patterns. And the majority of these indiv individuals had viral loads that were sort of just erratic and going up and down and much more consistent with missing doses as opposed to failing with adherence to therapy. And then the most important thing here is even this small number of individuals who met criteria for virologic failure on dolutavir lamivudine to drug initial therapy did not develop any new integrase or reverse transcriptase resistance. So it's very reassuring that if we do opt for this option, for those individuals who meet this criteria for two drug initial ART, the risk of virologic failure and the risk of developing new resistance mutations appears to be small. So these are the investigator conclusions, overall low and comparable confirmed virologic withdrawals through 96 weeks, no pattern by baseline CD4 viral load, no treatment emergent genotypic or phenotypic integrase or reverse transcriptase resistance, most failures due to non-adherence, and this supports the durability and high barrier to resistance of dolutavir-lamivudine as initial therapy. So here's my question. It, none of us have recommended this or prescribed this as initial therapy so far, so why not? Should we be, or as we've talked about before, are we all just much more comfortable using three-drug therapy at first and then switching to this as maintenance? And if so, why? This is pretty reassuring data. Is it just really a paradigm shift for us to go to, to go to two drugs using for initial therapy, or are there really uh, more serious concerns about it? So when we finish the didactic section here, we'd love to hear your thoughts on that. But let's turn to a different topic and let's review some metabolic outcomes data for this more novel two drug therapy. And we will review the mechanism and some key points about both of these drugs. And of course, metabolic outcomes data are of very hot interest these days. And one of the areas of interest, as we've reviewed, is that there does seem to be data for increased weight gain and perhaps incidence of uh, metabolic syndrome and other metabolic complications with integrase inhibitors like dolutegavir or with TAF. So we're interested in looking at the same outcomes with agents from other classes. So this is a drug called Islatrovir. We've mentioned it here before, and you will be hearing about it more. Uh, there were some previous data uh, suggesting that as pre-exposure prophylaxis, it may be effective even as a once-per-year implant. Uh, so that made headlines, and we reviewed some of that data. Here is a review of the mechanism. So it is a totally new class of agent called an NRTTI, a nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor. There are some differences between this agent and the NRTIs we've been using for years. Uh, so here, just a reminder that during the process of reverse transcription, the HIV enzymes create this viral DNA copy using the RNA template. And as base pairs are added, our traditional NRTIs get incorporated, but because they don't have this sort of key three prime hydroxyl end, once our traditional NRTIs get incorporated, they, just, they are chain terminators, they stop the process. The difference, and again, I'm probably not going to do this justice with this latrovir, is it does have that three prime hydroxyl, so it gets incorporated and either stops the chain there and halts the process of translocation, which is sort of moving base pairs out of the way so more can be made, or if the viral enzyme incorporates it and continues the translocation process, there are other mechanisms by which it halts the chain in a more delayed fashion, and these uh, the wall sort of crumbles here and the building blocks sort of fall apart. So a couple key points about this. So there are unique mechanisms here. There are multiple mechanisms from this same agent. And there are a lot of potential benefits. There also are publications now with way more detail going into that mechanism. So if you want to learn more, you can find that online. Uh, there are some potential advantages here. Islatrovir does appear to be active against isolates with major pre-existing NRTI resistance. Remember that the mechanisms, going back here a sec, remember that there are a couple mechanisms for NRTI resistance. One is if our traditional NRTIs are getting incorporated here, there are really two mechanisms for NRTI resistance. One is that they actually get sort of spliced back out and kicked out of the chain. The other is that the virus learns to incorporate sort of functional base pairs instead of our NRTIs. So there are a couple different mechanisms of NRTI resistance, and it does appear that Islatrovir is much more 
has a much higher barrier and that does not happen nearly as readily. In addition, some NRTI resistance mutations like K65R may actually increase the activity of this latrovir. So it may be active with our common known NRTI mutations. It may be hyperactive with some specific mutations. And then the barrier to resistance of this drug does appear to be relatively high. And then importantly, it does have a very long intracellular half-life approximately 190 hours with oral dosing. And then we've discussed that with other formulations like injections or implants, it may, be, it may become available at much less frequent dosing. So there's a lot of interest in novel formulations and infrequent dosing with this agent. And then let's just review briefly Duraverine, the most recently approved NRTI, the other part of this potential two drug combination. So remember some potential advantages of Duraverine compared to previous NRTIs. So it offers once daily dosing with no food requirements. So that's a, a difference over real piverine. There also are fewer drug-drug interactions. For example, it is not a contraindication with a PPI. And then it does appear to have more favorable effects on lipids than prior agents like efavirenz and nevirapine. And importantly, it does retain in vitro activity against isolates with some common NRTI mutations, as I've listed here, not all mutations, but some common NRTI mutations. Uh, so, for example, if someone has failed a favorance with a K103N, Draverine is still an option, but there are other NNRT, NNRTI mutations that will affect its activity. So, with NNRTI resistance, we always have to plug into the Stanford database or another tool and estimate the activity of Draverine. That's just my brief review. So, here let's look at this study called Drive to Simplify. So, this is a study that Eventually, I'll talk about the process, but eventually looks at two drug therapy with oral islatrovir and duraverine compared to the three drug combination uh, that is FDA approved with duraverine, lamivudine, and TDF. So this study enrolled treatment naive adults with a detectable viral load and a CD4 count above 200 no known ARV drug resistance, and no active hep B or hep C. The primary endpoints were virologic and were adverse events. But we're going to look now with this abstract at some metabolic outcomes. This was the general strategy of the study. You can see this is a phase 2B study, so it's relatively smaller uh, than the phase 3 trials we've talked about. So here what they did is they enrolled treatment of individuals, randomized them to either three dr this three-drug deravirine option, or starting with three drugs with this latrovir at multiple possible doses, plus deravirine, plus 3TC, and then if tolerated and if suppressed, then at 24 weeks, transitioning to eslatrovir, again, at multiple possible doses, plus deravirine for two-drug maintenance therapy. And then what's going to happen, or is in the process of happening, is those individuals who are still suppressed and tolerating the drug will go on all the way out to 144 weeks with eslatrovir and deravirine maintenance therapy, and with the big difference being a specific dose of eslatrovir will be chosen. So this abstract from Croy looked at certain metabolic outcomes as listed here, again comparing islatrovir deravirine to deravirine lamivudine TDF, and they looked at these outcomes here at 48 weeks. So a key point is we're going to be assessing those outcomes after 24 weeks of triple therapy and then an additional 24 weeks of eslatrovir deravirine. The baseline characteristics are here. I'll just note a couple of things. The median BMI at baseline was 23 to 24. As with um, many HIV clinical trials, unfortunately, there were not many women and not many people of color in the study, and most were relatively young. Here's the mean baseline CD4 count and the uh, proportion with a viral load above 100,000. And then here are the key findings, and I'll just let you look through the characteristics on the left that were assessed, again, at 48 weeks, comparing islatrovir deravirine dual therapy to deravirine lamivudine TDF therapy. And I'll just highlight that the only statistically significant difference here was the mean percent change in hip bone marrow density, as noted here, and these are percent changes. So an overall, not hugely clinically impressive change, but a statistically significant difference here. So the, the results in summary and the conclusions of the investigators were that the change in weight and BMI were similar in both arms, consistent with average weight gain in the general population. And if we try to compare this to the studies we've talked about, about integrase inhibitors and TAF, this does appear overall to be a lower average weight gain in those studies. So 
some suggestion that maybe uh, these options with deraverine or with deraverine TDF may lead to less metabolic and weight change than options with, for example, dolutegravir and TAF over time, but not a direct comparison. So I would definitely not hang my hat on that conclusion. But really, the overall effects here on body composition and metabolic parameters with this latrovir deraverine were uh, very modest and did not raise a lot of concern. So this combination is going into phase three trials, both for treatment naive and treatment experienced individuals. So look out in the near future for additional studies of oral islatrovir, either daily or weekly dosing, injectable islatrovir, and then again, as we're all very eager to see more about the potential for a once yearly implant for PrEP with islatrovir. These are the limitations that I noted, which was relatively short follow-up and no TAF or interase inhibitor comparison. But again, I think very interesting to see how this data evolves over the next year or two. Finally, switching topics, a note about HIV cure and an update about the quote-unquote London patient. And we'll do a little bit of review here from a year ago when this was first presented at CROI 2019. And I think just the one point to step back and keep in mind is just, just remember that HIV enters CD4 cells at initial infection and early in HIV infection using the CCR5 co-receptor. It's kind of the one thing to keep in mind as we review this data. So this is the case history for the London patient diagnosed with HIV in 2003, 10 years later diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma, started on ART first with a Favarin's emtricitabine TDF, did achieve a suppressed viral load, then changed therapy to avoid interactions with chemotherapy, unfortunately failed multiple rounds of chemotherapy and failed to mobilize his own cells for an autog autologous stem cell transplant. So then underwent an allogeneic stem cell transplant from a donor who was primarily HLA, HLA matched and then most importantly was homozygous for the CCR5 Delta 32 mutation, meaning one of the unique individuals who does not have the CCR5 co-receptor on their T cells, so does seem to have innate resistance to HIV entering their T cells. So I think that's a very important thing to note as we go forward reviewing this case. This individual then received conditioning chemotherapy, and then in May 2016, a stem cell infusion. You can see here a list of complications that occurred as a adverse effect of the stem cell infusion, and then his CD4 cells were shown to be fully engrafted with full chimerism, if you will. So meaning all of this individual's, the recipient cells had become CCR5 negative like the donor. And that's also a very key point. In September 2017, uh, he stopped ART. What we saw at CROI 2019 and was published at that time was that his HIV RNA in the plasma had been undetectable 18 months after ART stoppage. Here is the update from CROI 2020. A year later, he has maintained T-cell chimerism at 99%, meaning still 99% of his T-cells lack that CCR5 receptor. So his T-cells have nearly fully, nearly 100% converted from having the CCR5 co-receptor to not having it at all. His peripheral HIV RNA remains below one copy per mil, now 30 months post-stoppage of ART. And now what we have is much more extensive investigation trying to look for active replicating HIV at other sites in the body. So he has negative HIV DNA and RNA in the CSF, in multiple sites in the gut and in semen. He had low level detected HIV DNA in lymph nodes and memory T cells. However, they did not seem to be replication competent. They did not seem to be actively replicating or clinically significant. And the investigators use this term HIV DNA fossils, which I liked. He also no longer has a Western blot immune response to HIV, despite having an immune response and reactivation of other viruses like CMV. So I think this is also very interesting to note. And then the investigators did some complicated mathematical modeling, which they predicted that the probability of cure for this individual and potentially other individuals who go through the same process is over 99% if 90% chimerism of the T cells is maintained and over 90% if greater than 80% chimerism is maintained. So uh, this was a comparison presented at CROI 2019 by the lead investigator comparing the London patient whose name has not been disclosed 
to the quote-unquote Berlin patient, Timothy Brown, who we've talked about before, who has been okay with his name being disclosed. And you can see here a couple of differences in terms of the malignancy that was diagnosed, in terms of the number of allogeneic stem cell transplants that the individuals underwent, the total body radiation that occurred, the intensity of conditioning chemotherapy, and a couple of other more sort of subtle differences. But I think for all intents and purposes, these are the individuals in the world that we consider to be quote unquote cured, if you want to use that term, or in sustained remission after stem cell transplant in the setting of HIV infection. To compare these to several other case studies, the Dusseldorf patient was also someone we heard about at Croy 2019 who had been through a similar process and similarly appeared to be in sustained remission, but that was only four months post-transplant, so this was called a likely cure. I did not see an update from Croy 2020. Unless I missed it, I was a little bit surprised because now he would be approximately 16 months post-transplant, so we may see an update soon. And then if we compare these individuals to the Essen patient, this is somebody who went through the same or a similar stem cell pr transplant process, but was not cured. And the relapse was attributed to CXCR4 variants present in this recipient individual's CD4 cells prior to the transplant. So he did not uh, maintain full CCR5 chimerism because his own C CXCR4 variant sort of reared their head and HIV was able to enter the cells that way. And then the Boston patients who received stem cell transplants, but not from CCR5 minus donors, also relapsed. So if we put this all together, cure or sustained remission is possible with allogeneic stem cell transplant if these criteria are met, if the recipient's HIV is 100%, that should be CCR5, CCR5 using before transplant. If the donor is CCR5 deletion homozygous, meaning their T cells do not have CCR5 co-receptor, and then if 100% chimerism or engraftment occurs, in other words, the recipient's T cells become 100% CCR5 deleted. So the message I take from this is that cure is possible, but this is an extensive, risky, not to mention expensive process that we certainly cannot offer to anyone. So we may learn very interesting and useful things from this, but what we need are simpler, more widely available, more accessible, and less risky treatments that delete the CCR5 co-receptor or combine deletion of the CCR5 co-receptor with other mechanisms of action. There also was an abstract at Croy 2020, just as a last note, about an infant who may have been cured, an infant who contracted HIV intrauterine and then started ART very early, I think it was 33 hours, and then uh, stopped ART at about a year and three years later is still undetectable. But the investigators noted that they don't really know if it was the ART or other mechanisms or something about the, the child's immune system, so they're still investigating it. So I didn't include that abstract here, but if you want to see more about that, I, I do think that's really intriguing as well. And I'll stop there. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West AETC Project Echo Didactic Series. If you like this talk, please click the red subscribe button and please check out other talks in our series. Until next time, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off.